Hi, my name is Jonathan Manning. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today to learn a little more about our landscape's water needs. So why would we have to know about our landscape's water needs? I mean, we all have a timer at, the, at home. If we set it for a little more than the plants need and just leave it running all year round about the same time, why would we have to even think about it? Well, this is a water conservation class, so I would say that's how we waste the most water here in the desert is by those timers running without any management and just putting more water out there than the plants even need. So we're gonna talk about how to keep your plants very, very healthy, get all the water they need, but not waste water. And two main concepts we'll go over. One is the frequency of watering, and we're gonna learn how your plants can tell you when they need water. That's the way you really ride the line of efficiency on watering. If you know right before the plants are about to need water and you water only on that frequency and that changes year round, and we'll talk about all that, that's the way you really get efficient watering. And the other way is putting that water deeply in the soil, deep watering, and we'll talk about that too. That's another way you save water. You put that water deep down in the soil where it's um, not getting evaporated away into the air, but the tree roots or plant roots can get it down deep. We'll go into those concepts, talk about mainly how to make your plants stay beautiful through heat and cold all year round, and also save lots of water in the process of doing it. It'll be a little more management on your part, but it'll be worth the savings, and we'll talk about all the ways we can do it. So the slide that's up right now has my email. Um, I would always love any questions or pictures you wanna send me. I'll get back to you when I can. As far as answers go, uh, take that down if you need it. Don't be afraid to use it. And we'll get right into it then. So the first, tr this chart that's up now is a chart you can find uh, at the Water Services Department of most cities. There's a lot of them online, different sources for this card. It's a basic chart uh, made by Water Use It Wisely, and it's a guideline for how often to water your landscape. It's very handy. It's a good place to start if you don't know where. It does divide the seasons up, you know, spring, summer, fall, winter. So that's good because you should be changing that timer's frequency at least four times a year. Um, I would like to add five times a year because in the monsoon season when it gets real humid, you should really back off the water a little bit then too. So this is a good guide, but I do want to talk about a few details of this chart as we go through it. So the one thing that a lot of people don't notice is at the very bottom in fine print, it says these guidelines are for established plants, one year for shrubs and three years for trees. So the frequency of watering on this chart means your plants are very deeply rooted, mature, able to deal with the hot, dry, windy day without wilting, things like that, established. And we'll talk about the benefits of uh, having an established plant as far as tolerating all those environmental conditions. And um, it's very important that if you're using this chart as a guideline that your plants are that way. They're established, they've been in for a while and you've been watering them correctly this whole time they've been in is another challenge. So that's an important detail of using this chart. Um, the, the frequency does change when the plant is newer, so that was for established plants. What happens if the plants are brand new? Right, right away when they plant them in the, your yard, most likely your timer will be set for every day, at least once a day, maybe twice. That's because a plant in the nursery in its pot needs water that often. There's no roots to hold water. Uh, once you get it in the ground, they're going to need that same frequency of water in the beginning. You're going to want to soak that water in deep so the roots follow it down, but they'll still need to be watered very frequently. This chart is a good example of kind of the first eight weeks of getting the plants in. It's from very frequently, every day or two, uh, to later on every three, four, five, six, you know, spreading that frequency out more and more until you finally get to the frequency of the previous chart, which is, again is for established plants. So the age of your landscape very much depends on um, how much water it's going to need. And the next part I want to talk about on that same chart we've been seeing here is the next piece of fine print is drip run times, typically two hours for each watering. That's another thing that varies a lot between yards. So I, it would be nice if I could just tell all of you that you should water your landscape every seven to ten days, you know, through the summer, something like that, easy. Everybody's the same, but it's not. So what ma mainly varies is uh, your soil type, and that's why this says typically two hours of a run time, because in different types of soil, that may vary. So it's another thing to watch out for on the chart. You might have to adjust, and here we'll talk about which way you might have to adjust that one way or the other for your particular landscape. 
So the soil types vary. Everybody's soil types vary. The two extremes would be sandy gravelly and then this real dense clay maybe that's been compacted by you know equipment driving over it that doesn't drain at all. So sandy gravel with the water goes right through it, boom, right to the bottom as deep as you deep as it can go, as fast as it can go. The other opposite would be that clay soil, especially compacted clay, water might sit on the surface for days without soaking in. So that's a very big difference in how you're going to apply water to that soil, right? So we'll talk more about that later, but that's one thing to keep in mind that uh, the type of soil that you have can change what that chart recommends as far as water frequency mainly. So let's, uh, let's get into the specifics about your particular landscape and all these things that can tell you which way you should adjust that chart to fit your own, your own plant needs. The first question I always get, I've worked in a nursery for a very long time, and the first question people come in when their plants are not looking good is, I don't know if I'm watering too much or not enough. So I thought I'd go over that first. It's a very common question with a very easy answer. If uh, the soil dries out on the surface between waterings, it cannot be too much water. Too much water is when the soil never dries out for weeks, months at a time. So too much water is not drying out between waterings. If it is drying out real good on the surface between waterings, you can rule out too much water. I mean, too much water is a problem. Some plants die from it. Some plants have nutrition problems from it. Uh, and other than that, it's just a waste of water. And we're talking about water conservation here. So too much water is a problem, but you can outrule it if, uh, if the surface of the soil dries out between waterings. Later, we'll talk about being too dry, and that's much more complicated. But to eliminate too much water is pretty simple. I got a few slides here that would go over other instances of, of too much water. One would be if you see moss growing, maybe toads taking up residence. That, that means the water never dries out. That, that moss would not grow if there was even one or two days of drying out between watering. So signs of moss, it's usually on the north side of the house where the sun doesn't shine, probably in the winter time. But if it's happening, it means you're, not, you're watering too frequently. That surface is never drying out between waterings. Here's a couple ways you could be watering too much that's not affecting the plant growth. In this case, it's a lawn, a, a lawn that's uh, either its run time is much, much too long for the, the lawn itself, and that water is going across the sidewalk into the gutter, and I found it two or three blocks down the street. So that means either the, either the something went wrong in the irrigation system that day that I found it, maybe the valve stuck, something like that. Either way, this is too much water. <laughs> too much water in a way that's not hurting the plant the lawn is fine, but it's just excess water, more than the lawn would ever be able to use, obviously, all that water going down the gutter. So that's too much water. And um, we're going to think about conservation. There's a few more tips about conservation besides the ones I opened up with. Any water that's applied out of the reach of the plant's roots is a waste. So that means, um, you know, that runoff that goes off into the curb and down the street. If the whole entire uh, gravel area where you don't really want any plants is getting wet from a sprinkler that oversprays that way. That's a waste of water because there's no roots over there that are going to need that water. The next one would be drip emitters left open where plants have died. Many of us have, you know, our, our landscape was originally had 25 gallon shrubs in the front yard and we're down to five that have made it over the years. We'll cap off those other 15 drip emitters that aren't needed anymore. That'd be a good way to save some water and then focus that water uh, more on the plants that you do want that are surviving and looking well and they'll grow better and look even better with the extra water. So that's another way to kind of focus that water from where it's not needed to where it is needed. Remember what we're trying to do is make our plants look beautiful at the same time as we're conserving water. So leaks, broken sprinkler heads, missing drip emitters, I mean that's pretty obvious. If you got water geysering over into your neighbor's yard every time your drip system comes on, that's a waste of water. And that's a good place where you might put a cap on that drip emitter. Broken pipes need fixing, things like that. Anywhere water's going where there's not a plant there to use that water is a waste of water. How about um, sprinklers just out of adjustment? We talked a little bit about if they're spraying the brick wall instead of the lawn. You know, your lawn's drying out looking bad while the wall's getting salt residue on it from the spray. So things like that. Make sure sprinkler heads and drip emitters are adjusted. Excessive run times is the last thing I would talk about. And that means that, um, there, I mean, especially in sandy gravel soil where that water goes right through it, 
at some point you're soaking water deep, so deep in the soil that the roots can't reach it. I mean, six feet is a little deeper than most roots can reach, and that would be a waste of water too. So we want to adjust that run time uh, to soak the water into just the right depth, and we'll talk about what depth that is and how to do it. So those are just the ways that we're going to um, conserve water at the same time as focusing what water we do use on those plants that really need it. So we've talked about too much water, pretty easy to eliminate that option if it is or isn't, and some ways to save water. How about if we need to put more water out there? This means the plants are dry. So the soil dries out between waterings. We, now we know it's not too much water. Plants aren't looking good still though, so maybe it's not enough water. This goes back to that question of is it too much or not enough. So they could be too dry. We're going to learn the signs of drought in different types of plants because to me that is the best way to water my landscape efficiently is wait for any kind of signs of drought and then I know that I need to put that water on in a, either in a different way or more frequently. So here's some signs. I mean uh, most uh, all of us have different plants in our landscape. This is the problem too. Is another reason why I can't just tell you exactly how to set your timer and be done with it. Because some yards have many lush, you know, leafy plants that need more water. Other yards have a mesquite tree, a native tree, and, and some cactus and agaves that would need much, much less water and eventually no water. So they vary a lot. We'll talk about different types and how to tell if they need water or not. And these are the signs that you're going to use to more efficiently give your plants water only when they need it. So here's three citrus trees in 15 gallon pots. The one on the right, I think most people would recognize that it's wilted, it's droopy. You know, if you touch the leaves, it would be soft, like old lettuce in the fridge or something. Soft, droopy leaves, they cup, citrus do. You know, they taco up a little bit. Um, but most plants wilt. Most leafy trees and shrubs wilt. Not all of them do, but if they do, it's a good sign that they need water like right now. That's a sign that it needs water immediately. And if you water them immediately, they perk back up and you won't even see any damage. Nothing will happen. You'll go right back to normal, but that is definitely a sign that, okay, my frequency is a little bit too far at this point, so I need to water more frequently. Um, the, the one on the left is the way it should look. Everything's perky. The middle of the tree is full of leaves. So that's the sign we're going to look at next because the one in the middle has balding in the middle, right? The middle of the tree, the oldest leaves it has, have turned yellow and fallen out. And what that is is the more subtle sign of drought. Um, as trees or shrubs, leafy trees or shrubs, as they dry out and get watered and dry out and get watered, and when that drought is a little too much, to support all those beautiful leaves that the tree on the left has, the tree naturally drops off some leaves. Well, they drop off the oldest leaves that are the least efficient, the ones that are inside the middle of the tree that are shaded by the new fresh ones on the outside. So those leaves in the middle are just the least useful to the tree. And when there's not enough water to support all the leaves, those turn yellow, fall out. Natural process takes weeks to months to really die from that. I mean, it's, a, it's just a something you can look for, and that would be something if you notice your plants are a little thin in the middle, you know, green and juicy on the outside, but a little thin in the middle, that's a real good sign to catch and know that you need to apply a little more water. Um, nothing deadly or urgent about the situation. You just pay attention, you know, on a weekly basis or more, and if you see any of these signs showing up, you know you'll need to apply more water. Um, none of them are going to die because if you pay attention often, and you first notice any of these signs of drought, either of these two signs of drought, it, you won't kill the plants by letting them get to that point. You can correct the situation, and now you know you're riding that line of real efficiency as far as water frequency goes. You'll get to know your landscape too, and after the first couple of times of catching them like that, you'll know that this time of year with these conditions, I need to water every so many days. That's the, that's the part I can't tell you because everybody has different soil, different irrigation systems, and different plants. So I'm giving you the information, hopefully, to be able to, de to decide that yourself. The, this is a little example, same example of a hibiscus plant, right? The one on the right this time is the way it should look. Nice, juicy leaves all over it. It's getting plenty of water for all those leaves. If it were to dry out, get watered, dry out, get watered um, a little too much, it starts looking like the one on the left. That's that balding in the middle look, you know. If I was to touch those leaves all the way around, they're juicy and green. The leaves that are on that left side plant are very perky, healthy, juicy green. 
but it's lost all those leaves out of the middle because of that random period periodic drought so that, that's the subtle sign that I want you to pay attention to that means you might be needing a little more water than you're giving them even desert shrubs this is a green cloud sage is very common in desert landscapes they're able to handle a lot of drought but there comes a point when they get too much the one on the right is that subtle sign of drought, the thinning, the bald in the middle, not real fluffy green. The one on the left is about as fluffy as they get, real fluffy, I got some uh, flowers on it even. That one's getting plenty of water. The one in the middle in this case is wilted. Would you notice that one's wilted? It's hard with desert plants. A lot of desert plants are kind of dusty gray anyway, the leaves are small, and it's hard to tell if it's wilted or not. So um, the one in the middle is wilted, needs water right this second and then digest it where it's getting more water um, in the future. The one on the right is that balding in the middle, slow sign of drought, and the one on the left is the way it should look. So just again and again, we're given some kind of same examples of leafy shrubs and trees, how they show you that they're not quite getting enough water in a way that's not deadly, but a way that makes you um, have some action in the future. So palms, if you think about it, it's the same method, same concept. Oldest leaves are turning yellow and not falling off, but they're turning yellow. So all palms, you know, the leaf comes out of the middle of the palm, and as they get older and older and older, they work their way, you know, new ones are coming out the top, and the older ones get further and further down the trunk. So palms always have some dead leaves at the bottom. You can trim those off if they're all the way dead. Even if they're yellow, I usually turn them off, trim them off. But if you find that those yellow leaves are getting further and further and further up close to the new one coming out the middle, that's probably a good sign of drought. It means they're not getting enough water to support all the leaves they have, and they're dying prematurely um, further and further up the trunk. So this one needs a little more water. Um, it's pretty healthy, but if those yellow leaves at the bottom were to keep go continuing getting more and more leaves turn yellow further up the trunk, that's how palms show you they need more water. There is, especially in the case of palms, sometimes the yellowing can be fertilizer problems but it's much, much less common than water problems here, just so you know. So usually I go with the most common problem first. I would make sure that I'm irrigating perfectly. And then after that, I would worry about maybe some kind of fertilizer problems, but it, it also could be the case in palms. Agaves, talk about a drought tolerant plant. Even they show you when they're dried out. The, the one on the left is obviously the dry one. What they do is they protect that, the center leaf that comes out the middle like a palm. It's like a little bitty palm. The, middle, the new leaf in the middle is the brand new one, and it works its way out again like palms do. So all the old leaves that are on the ground curl up and protect that middle growth. So, it, so during a period of drought, it protects the new growth. You know, The most important growth is the new growth. So all those old leaves fold up, protect it. A little bit of yellow color you might have seen a long time ago. A little bit of yellow, um, bronzy color on agaves means they're probably not getting enough water. Uh, maybe they're in a situation that's just getting too much sun for what that agave can handle also. But that bronzy yellow color in the summer especially is a good sign that they either need more water or they need to be planted in a different position where they get more shade. But they'll tell you also that they need more water. So how about cactus? The, the hardiest of all to drought but they can show you signs of, of um, drying out too much. And in this case, the shriveled leaves there, and one has even like bent over and fallen a little bit. I always let my cactus get to the point of showing a little bit of shrivel in the leaves um, because that shows that they're ready for water to me. That's the way cactus are made. They're made to shrink up a little bit in drought and puff back up with water. Cactus that are puffed up with water all the time have much more danger of rotting a lot of, I've had cactus just rot off at the ground and fall over and it's a mucky, gross mess there at the base where it goes into the ground. That's usually from too much water. So you have a much better chance of killing a cactus with too much water than you do of not enough water. So I ride the line of hardly any water. And what I do is watch for a little bit of shrivel in the pads or the next slide will be the different kind of cactus, but I watch for them to shrink up a little bit. Then I'd water them very, very well. Long, deep soak with the hose. And this saves a lot of water, especially if you have a, a lot of cactus in your landscape. What you can do is cap the drip emitters. I would, honestly. If you're here year-round to take care of these things, I would cap the drip emitters. They're not going to need anywhere near the water that all your trees and shrubs do. And if you have time to go check them, maybe it's going to be once a month, uh, once every couple months in the winter, you'll notice that they're starting to shrivel up a little bit. Then you put the water on them for two, three hours, a long, deep soak, get them real wet 
and that'll be it again for another couple months. So an established cactus can go a very long time without water, and they honestly, they should. Not only does it save a lot of water uh, without the, the drip system putting water on it at the same frequency as all those trees and shrubs, but they stay healthier because of it. So the other kind of cactus, this is like a, a prickly pear type cactus, the other kind would be any kind of columnar cactus with the accordion shaped trunks, you know, the tubes that go up. That means barrel cactus, saguaros, organ pipes, cirrus like this. And what happens is those ribs that I have my fingers on the sides of will get very, very skinny and then very, very fat. If you looked at the, di the, the top view of any of them, they would swell up to be almost a perfect cylinder and they would shrink down to be those accordion pleats very, very deep. So you just, again, you ride that line of you don't want them to turn yellow. You don't want them to uh, get so dry that they like bend in half. They'll do that eventually. But a little bit of shrinking up is perfect. So that's the way you really save a lot of water and keep cactus healthy. So the plants are dry. We've, now you know some signs. You, you've went out, you've realized, okay, I've waited long enough now. And some of them start showing me signs that they're dry. So what do I do about it? The, the drought thing is much more complicated than the too much water. So there's three aspects. That's what we're gonna go over. Three ways that you might not be getting enough water. And this is, this is where it gets a little confusing because as I say, when you work in a nursery, people are coming in with this question. I usually recommend that they're, the plants might not be getting enough water. And I get some fight back a lot because people say, I water it every day. There's no way it's not enough water. Well, I find go in, you know, to ask a few more questions and I find that maybe they are squirting it with the hose every day or their drip system is only running for five minutes every day. Well, that's a problem too. So the roots down deep aren't getting any water, even though you're watering it every day. This is where it gets complicated and this is where I'm going to try to demystify it. Um, the, so the three aspects, we can kind of go into the details of these problems. The frequency is what everyone thinks of when I say you're not watering enough, right? I'm not watering often enough. That's frequency. It's how often your drip system kicks on. And it's also how, if you do it with the hose even, it's how often you go drip it with the hose. So that's frequency. And it, you, on the timer, it's like days of the week, or a lot of timers use skip days, but that's the setting on a timer that you're working with when you deal with frequency. Frequency is what I change all year round though. Like I say, at least five times a year, I go into the timer and adjust that frequency either less often or more often. And it's more often when the weather is hot, I think is pretty obvious. It's also more often when the weather is very, very dry. That's another aspect you gotta keep in mind. That when the air is dry, plants dry out faster. And when the air is humid, even at the same temperature, the plants stay wet longer. So that's frequency, it changes all year round. The other two aspects, I don't ever change. Once I figured out my landscape, in my particular landscape with my soil, I don't ever change it. So the next, that next one of those is depth. And that's the one that a lot of people aren't doing correctly. Depth on your timer would be the run time. Or if you're using the hose, it's how long you leave it on for, dripping on that plant. If you leave it dripping on the tree for two hours, two hours is your run time. And all that does is soak in deeper and deeper and deeper. It's the only thing that, um, the only thing that affects how deep the water soaks in is how long you run it for, all in one setting. That's the run time. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about that because it's oftentimes that's where people get confused. As I'm watering, my frequency is every day. It can't be too much water, or can't be not enough water. But that water's only soaking in an inch deep, and this is exactly how um, we waste water. As uh, everyday watering, it soaks in one inch deep in the soil. That first inch of soil evaporates into the air and the roots of the plant never even touched it. So we've put an wa inch of water out there every day and wasted it to the air. That's so, even though we're watering every day, the plant's still dying and we're still wasting water. So that's, that's a common way that we don't water correctly that we'll fix today. The last one uh, is the area that's the wet spot that gets wet. And I honestly, I think this is the most common reason a lot of people's plants are suffering from drought even though their timer is set perfectly. Because this one has nothing to do with the timer. This one has to do with how many drip emitters or how big of an area you get wet when you water it, right? Old fashioned flood irrigation was the best. The water goes in all directions as far as those roots could reach it. It's wonderful. It's rare that anybody has it anymore. If you aren't lucky enough to have it, 
we're stuck with a big well like a like we used to do you know you build like a berm around the tree and fill it up with water it's a good way to do it but remember that berm has to be as big around as the tree so as the tree gets bigger and bigger you got to build that berm wider and wider to be the width of the tree and then when you fill up that berm with water you don't just fill it up and let it drain you fill it up and leave the hose leaking in there to stay full for a certain amount of time and that amount of time will be your run time to soak it in deep. So that's another way to get the whole area under the tree wet. A lot of people don't like the looks of a berm in the front of their gravel front yard, right? So now we're down to just drip irrigation with drip emitters that are kind of hidden by the gravel. It's the way most people like to see their irrigation out there. And it's the hardest way to get the whole area under a plant wet. Most uh, plants are installed with just one drip emitter right there at the base of the shrub. A tree might get two right there at the trunk. And I, honestly, uh, you can't blame the landscaper because when you first install a plant, you have to put the drip emitter right there. It's the only place there's roots. So it's up to the homeowner to, as time goes on, add drip emitters further out. You could dig down, find the polytubing underground, add drip emitters further out toward the edge of that canopy of the tree or shrub and give more water to those trees and shrubs as they get bigger. That means the whole area under the plant theoretically should be wet when you water. With drip irrigation, it's kind of hard, but you gotta have a lot of them underneath that big tree to wet enough surface area to get all those roots wet when they water. So any one of those three things could be going wrong if your plants are showing signs of drought, um, but you think you're watering frequently enough, for example. So. We'll get into the details of each of these three ways that you could not be watering enough. There's that chart again. How frequently should I water? The chart is a good uh, place to start. You know, Use it as a guide, and then we'll adjust it according to your plant's needs and your soil type. Remember the basic rule. In the end, if really all you did was watch the soil surface, you would know how often to water. Um, if you go out and you find the soil surface wet, and you know your irrigation system is about to water, it's time to back it up a little bit because you definitely don't want to water when the soil surface is still wet. If the soil surface has been dry a while, a couple days, it could come on, or if you know your plants could handle the time longer without water, I would let them handle it for longer without water. Here's something about um, the frequency. The longer you let plants go without water, the harder they work on getting their roots deep in the ground because that's where the water ends up. You know, the water soaks in and the last place to find it is as deep as you go. So those roots go down searching. When they're under a little stress from drought, they go searching. They put a lot of work into a big root system that's wide and deep because they'll, you know, that's what they do. They, they don't want this to happen again. So they prepare for the future by fortifying that root system, getting it well established. Remember we're talking about established from the chart. An established landscape is one that all the plants have deep, big root systems. And the only way they get that is from struggling a little bit to find water. They don't go looking for it if it's always right there. So it's a good way to make your plants stronger in the future to any kind of drought or wind or things that could hurt them if they're not quite so well established. So by letting your plants suffer a little tiny bit and knowing when it's too much and then giving it to them, that's, that's the, what we're going to do. Again, it's making your plants healthier than they would have been by having water constantly available always right there at the roots. So you wait until the surface dries out, then you could water or you could wait to the point where you see a little bit of signs of drought. Um, these are the things that affect frequency. Uh, temperature, I think most people understand. When it's hot, you water more. When it's cold, you water less. <laughs> that one makes sense. Uh, sunlight, plants in the shade need less water less often than plants in the full sun. That one makes sense too. Two that people don't think about as enough, I think, is wind and humidity. So dry wind whew, like sucks the water out of plants like crazy. Um, that's when you get uh, plants that wilt. If they're going to wilt, it's going to be on a hot, dry, windy day. And um, if the uh, humidity is very high, the water stays in that plant better. You know, a calm, muggy day, which is weird because that's when I feel the worst, right? A, a muggy day with no breeze is like the worst I can imagine. It's the best situation for your plants, loving it. So it's the opposite. You can't go by what you feel. You know, I'm feeling hot and sweaty today because it's muggy. I'm gonna go water more often to my plants because they work differently. So plants love muggy, uh, you know, and, and uh, don't like hot, dry winds. So 
this is a good example of that as far as the months of the year go. And the thing I like to point out on this is if you follow this chart, if you go up from May where that sunshine is, the level of irrigation is about the same as if you went up from August. Do May and August seem the same to us? To, to me, it doesn't. I mean, May seems really, really nice with some nice breeze and dry air and only in the 90s. And August, I mean, it could be 110 and humid and no breeze, you know. So to me, it feels so different. But your irrigation needs are about the same. And the reason that is, is because May is dry and windy almost every year, right before summer starts. It's the, the humidity is very low and the wind is high. And then in August, boop, the monsoon starts and it gets humid. So it's about the same amount of water. Even though it's cooler in May, you're watering more often because of that hot, dry wind. So just keep that in mind. Those are factors that you're gonna need. And if you're looking at your plants again, that's when you'll notice the wilt is in that hot, dry, windy situation. And then you'll know that you need to water a little bit more frequently. So that was that watering schedule for newly planted plants again, just to remind me to tell you that brand new plants I have seen in a few cases, you know, I hand somebody that chart, here you go, this is how you should water, and I don't realize that all their plants are brand new, and you can't end up killing them all, because a brand newly planted plant does need this schedule to get those roots deep in the ground, um, where they can find that water that you soak in deep. Then they're established, then you can follow the chart. But just, just a caution, brand new plants put out there, you need to baby them a little bit with water more frequently just until those roots can get themselves established down deep in the soil. So next, this is the next way you cannot be watering enough is soaking the water in deep enough. So for trees and shrubs in this area, I would say three feet deep is about as deep as the roots can like efficiently get water. Under that, there's no oxygen is the main problem. The deeper you get, the less oxygen there is and roots need oxygen also. So within that first three feet is about the sweet spot of how deep you can get for trees and shrubs. Uh, vegetable gardens, lawns, flower beds, things like that might only be a foot or two. You know, a little shallower, they're smaller plants, annual type plants that wouldn't need quite as deep a watering. Um, so if you're doing lawns, you're going to notice the run time is a little less on that chart than the drip, the run times for trees and shrubs. But that's what you're shooting for is that three foot for trees and shrubs with your drip system. And remember, the only thing that soaks water in deeper is a longer run time. The longer you let it sit there and drip, the longer, it's, the deeper it's going to soak in. And these are those three soil types again. The extremes are that sandy, gravelly soil that water goes right through and the clay that water sits on top of forever, right? So what does that mean for your drip system? The way I would uh, treat either one of these soils quickly, because it's not a whole irrigation class uh, as far as timer setting, but what I would do is in the sand, I use very heavy flow drip emitters, right? You want a lot of water to come out at once because that spreads it out a little bit. Um, you don't want like a one gallon per hour drip emitter on sandy soil because it drips in, disappears, and your wet spot's about that big. <laughs> there's, no, there's no spreading out in sand. So you need a lot of water coming out at once. Bubblers would be perfect, old-fashioned bubblers that really come pouring out. But you want as much water to flow out as, one, as you can at once, but you're going to soak it into three feet deep in maybe only a half an hour, 45 minutes. So your run times be much shorter. Now let's go to the clay. What if I did that on the clay? A bubbler putting out gallons of water and um, really fast, and I ran it for 45 minutes, it would just run anywhere it can, down into the gutter, into the pool I've seen happen before. It can't soak in as fast as it's coming out. So with that clay soil, it's the opposite. Everything's the opposite. Really dense clay that doesn't drain. You're gonna have to use very small drip emitters, maybe one gallon per hour, and you're gonna run them for a very long time to get it to soak in to three feet deep. You want three feet deep on both sides, except for it's gonna happen in about a half an hour, 45 minutes with, uh, with the sandy soil. And in the clay, it could take four or five hours. I mean, there is ways to check it. You can probe the soil. I won't get into a lot of that, but you need to uh, pay attention, kind of diagnose your own soil, see what's going on. And that's the ways I would go. Low flow, long run time on the clay, high flow, short run time on the sand is the basics of it for now. This is a little experiment I did uh, with the two drip emitters, same, same line, two drip emitters right on the soil. The regular, this is regular valley soil, um, sandy loam soil, like the flat part of the valley is all over town. And the left side one was a one gallon per hour drip emitter. 
the right side one was a four gallon per hour drip emitter, right? So they both ran for two hours. The run time's the same. Uh, and if you look, the depth is the same. The, the depth that it soaked in, that's a one foot ruler right there. They both soaked in about a foot. So the two hour run time made the, made, uh, the water soak into the same depth. What changed is the flow, right? The one gallon per hour and the four gallon per hour. So what did it do if they soaked in the same depth because of the run time, what did the two different emitters change? It's the width of that wet spot, right? The one on the right that was four gallons per hour spread out twice as far as the one on the left that was only one gallon per hour. So this is um, leading to our, our last problem with not getting enough surface area wet, right? That's what happens is a, the low flow drip emitters that most people use around here, they don't make a very big wet spot because there's not enough water coming out to spread out. Um, and that's where you uh, compensate by adding drip emitters. You add more and more and more. You can change them out to heavier flow. Uh, that would help too to be, get a bigger wet spot. In general, what you're looking for is to get the whole area under the plant wet, right? If it's a 20 foot tree, like theoretically, you're supposed to be getting the whole area under that tree wet. Luckily, trees tend to steal water from lawns and shrubs and things around them. But in essence, that's what you're looking for. The whole area underneath that tree, because that's where the roots are. The, the roots are at the edges of that drip line all the way around the tree. And if you're trying to, if a 20 foot tree is trying to get all of its water from one little wet spot on one side of the trunk, especially where there's not very many roots right next to the trunk, it's gonna have a hard time getting enough water for that whole 20 foot crown on top out of a little tiny wet spot one foot wide, you know? So you're trying to get all that area wet. Even on shrubs, big old shrubs, the way you can keep them from wilting is if they still have that one drip emitter right there at the trunk that's only one, one gallon per hour, um, and you went out and put you know four drip emitters that were four gallon per hour, now you're getting a lot more gallons of water to that plant when you water it. And honestly, when you get it established that way, you won't be watering more frequently. That's where you're gonna save water too, is the more established the root system is, the bigger and deeper the root system is because we're watering this way. Lots of water all at once, soaking into three feet deep. Um, the roots build deep down and you'll be watering less frequently and less frequently and less frequently. That's where we save water. So um, that's a, a desert landscape, say, if all, your if all your trees and shrubs are very well adapted to this climate, to the desert, maybe natives even better, there is a point five, 10 years down the road where you could turn your irrigation system off, maybe manually run it once or twice a year at the most extremes of heat and dry. Um, and that would be fine to keep everything looking terrific. So that's the goal in the end, um, would be to save tons of water that way and have a landscape that's beautiful. So there's that water placement, that one little drip emitter on a baby little shrub. Well, that baby shrub's not gonna be baby forever as it gets bigger. You spread it out and put more drip emitters on there. Here's a good example of um, getting the whole area underneath a tr pretty good sized tree wet. There's four drip emitters that must be pretty good heavy flow to make a big wet spot. That's about as good as it gets with drip irrigation. The whole area underneath that tree, those four wet spots under it, is about as good as it gets for area getting wet. So this is just a chart that helps me um, kind of uh, see in my mind how many gallons of water a plant really needs. This is just estimated. It's an average of different kinds of trees. But if you go to the maximum there, a 20 foot tree, which isn't that big of a tree, I mean, it, trees around here a lot of times get 40, 50 feet tall or wide. And um, for just a 20 foot tree, they're estimating that when you water in one time, the one time you put water out there, they could use about 235 gallons of water before they need water again, right? That's like one cycle. You put 235 gallons out there, and then as it dries out, it would need that much again at a certain point. So 235 gallons, just to uh, put in context what your drip system is putting out there, if you have two one gallon per hour drip emitters, I mean, you're gonna run it 235, two, you know, 100 and whatever hours, or are you gonna put 235 more drip emitters around it? it? It just to put it in context, your drip don't overestimate the amount of water your drip system is putting out there on the trees and shrubs that you do want to very thoroughly water when you water. So, um, trees and shrubs need a lot of gallons of water the older they get all at once when they get watered. 
but what that water does is soak into the root system, stores for a long time, and when it's stored in those roots and deep underground, it's safe from evaporation and waste and makes the tree much more uh, stronger and established for future problems that come up. So that's pretty much it as far as uh, your plant's water needs. We've learned about how to tell if your plants need water or not. That way you're riding that line of like not watering more than they need as far as frequency goes. We've talked about a few other problems like the depth of the water or the area that's getting wet on the surface. It might be problems where your frequency is perfect. You're watering just, just, the, just often enough for this time of year, but those other problems might be the, the reason why your plants are showing drought. So you fix those. Um, soaking in that water really deep in the soil is the way to uh, protect that water and store it for just the tree and not to have it lost to evaporation. Another way to save some water. And overall, good luck, and hopefully this helps you keep your landscape beautiful and your water bill low. Thanks. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.